Eva Wong. Eva, how are you? I'm great. Great to be here. But in that first week, we had like thousands of people sign up. So it was pretty exciting for us to be like, oh, like it just sort of felt a little bit more like, oh, this is what product market fit feels like. Yes. You put something out that's very far from perfect. But there's lots of people who are interested about it in it and telling their friends about it. Yeah. Uh, you partner with Equifax yep. as a as a partner for your to get the scores. What I want to understand is, isn't there like a conflict of interest uh, because we go to Equifax to get our credit scores uh, and understand it. But yeah. here you are, I can easy sign up to Borwell, attach my SIN number and boom, I, I've got my 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 credit score. <laughs> Welcome to the Hustle Over Everything podcast. This is the podcast where we receive stories, tips, and tactics from entrepreneurs who have done it to help you grow your business and grow as a person. I'm Alex. And I'm Owen Osinde. And today we have a treat for you. You know, I was talking to my my cousin, my family and friends, and I was like, yeah, today we're interviewing. Everyone's excited. Everyone's Every waiting for this. Everyone's excited and waiting for it. And... I was like, yeah, we're interviewing the COO of this company. And they were like, oh, okay, cool. And they're like, uh, so when are you going to interview him? And I was like, hmm. him? Like, yeah. are you for real? You know I him. And that really showed the bias. The bias, that, man. That, that's naturally implanted in us that mm -hmm. we haven't really touched on, you know? So today I'm sitting here with, like I said, a treat for you. He's sitting here with somebody who is a ground baker in tech, you know, who has broken through the mold and created a business that is empowering Canadians financially. Mm -hmm. We're sitting here with Eva Wang. Eva, how are you? I'm great. Great to be here. Most definitely. So first things first, I want to ask, I want to start off with the icebreaker. You know, because one thing you mentioned is entrepreneurship is either built in you or something you can learn and acquire over time. No, I want to get your opinion to one, of course. Absolutely, yep. What do you think? It's a, it's a, entrepreneurship something that's born within you or something that you can, you know, mature to, grow to, learn? What's your experience been like? I really believe that entrepreneurship is something that can be learned. Okay. I don't think scientists have yet discovered an entrepreneurship gene yep. or a particular strand of DNA where you have to be born with something. And I really think that anyone who's passionate about solving a problem can start a company and become mm. an entrepreneur. Mm. What do you think, Owen? I think uh, I think on I think you're born with certain traits that allow you to be an entrepreneur. I think if you are someone who is very you don't like following the rules a lot, you like being on your own and creating things, and you have a wild imagination, and you have like this hunger to really become something and to provide value to it. It's like a certain tenacity that everybody has who makes it in who makes a great business has these certain qualities. So I think there's certain traits you have that make an entrepreneur. But if you say, I'm going to teach you to be an entrepreneur, you can learn the fundamentals of what entrepreneurship is about. But if you have, if you don't have like the mental fortitude, the persistence, the desire and the hunger to be great, I don't think you're really going to sustain the journey to build something and see the vision all the way out. Mm. Are we starting off with a fight? Is this what you're teaching? Have you, Alex? Oh, and I are going to fight around with their we like we, we, we like confrontation. Yeah, it yeah. makes good for entertainment. That, that's how we started off. Yes. All right. So do you have any rebutt rebuttals to that? I, I do. I agree. I think there are certain qualities that you have to have. But I don't know if they're, you know, the, the, I think there's so many different combinations of qualities that that mm. you could have mm -hmm. i actually think someone who's a rule follower could start a business do you mm. know what i mean i think like someone who understands the rules i don't know like that that i might challenge a bit and i also think that a lot of times you're co-founding a company with a team mm -hmm. and so not any like single person is going to build a company by themselves you're mm -hmm. going to have a team of people that you do this with yes and so i think smart founders are going to find other teammates that will complement the skills that they have mm -hmm. i was gonna say like a lot of uh great entrepreneurs were first intrapreneurs um like great leaders um steve Ballmer, 
you know, he did not like was not like the founder of Microsoft, but he became a massive mover of Microsoft from its early days and increased the value of what Microsoft is. So you have to be like a smart follower. Don't be just like a blind follower and just do it. But you have to like know your strengths. And this kind of goes back to Gary Vee with everything he says, right? There's like this one clip I love of him. It's like, I can't code and you can't sell crap. Meaning like, <laughs> you know, just because you think you can be a great Python developer doesn't mean that like you can really go out there and do it. Like there's certain talent that you have and you really have to lean in on that talent to really double in on your value. Yep. And then, you know, over time by doubling in on, the, on what you bring, you become that person that you want to be that's looked at as a number one by your positioning yourself in what you do best at. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. I'd also say there's a growth mindset, right? Like, I don't know, there's, I may not be the best salesperson and maybe I shouldn't try, but maybe I should try, you know, mm -hmm. maybe that is a skill that I could develop. And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, I think that's always the balance is like, yeah. who are you today and who do you need to become to be that successful entrepreneur? Speaking of that, you know, going back into your come up, you're a Harvard graduate student. And this is where a lot of great, you know, these tech guys come from, right? Yeah. You either went to Stanford, um, Harvard, and what's another, like Penn, right? MIT. MIT. Princeton. When, Princeton. When you're, when you're funding a founder, the VCs tend to look at these people as they're going to be great entrepreneurs. And this kind of goes on to what we're saying, great entrepreneurs. So how was your Harvard experience? And you grad, you were there around like the time Facebook was starting out. What was the buzz around campus at the time? And, you know, like share us more about that time, like when you're back at, uh, you know, yeah. part of the Crimson Tide. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure if VCs do look for Harvard grads. And I think we've all heard the formula around the value of your company is 10 times the number of engineers you have minus however many MBAs you have. So <laughs> no, I don't never... have an MBA. What? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a... yeah. No, that's a thing. Really? I, I actually didn't do an MBA. I, I studied international development actually at, mm. at the Kennedy School. And it was a great experience. I, I really enjoyed my experience there. Uh, I really felt like the students that I was with didn't have that sense of entitlement, which mm -hmm. was what I was a little bit worried about. Everyone really just felt this great sense of privilege to be you know, part of the story and become part of the history. And uh, it's definitely a place that's bigger than any one person. So mm -hmm. I just felt like a great sense of privilege being able to be there. And it really impacted me, I think, in a couple ways. One is I really felt like I needed to give back because I, someone had invested in me to have this great experience. Yeah. Uh, and the second that I think you know, we'll, we'll maybe chat a bit about, because I think imposter syndrome is something that a lot of people feel, is I could always say it's like, well, I did get into Harvard, so I can't be like, you know, yeah. you know it's like one of those things that you can look back on. Uh, you know, maybe it was a mistake, but I do, did sort of feel like I was there and I wasn't yeah. the dumbest person there. So. I've always been curious, right? Like when you say you're a Harvard grad, this adds a lot of, uh, it brings a lot of cachet with it. So, you know, just, just, you know, having fun, you're like, when you walk in, you're, Hey, like, where'd you go? Oh, I went to Harvard. Like, what are the type of faces you get? And like, do you ever get tired of having that feeling of, ah, oh, like, you know, is it as a novelty worn off or is it just part of the game now? How do you, uh, how do you deal with that? So there's a bit of a joke that people who went to Harvard will never say they went to Harvard. Really? Yeah, uh, because I do think it's, it's also called dropping the H-bomb. Mm. Like it is, I don't know, I think mm. people just assume a lot of things that may yeah. not be true. Yeah. So uh, some of the code words to know that someone has gone to Harvard without saying they've gone to Harvard are, I went to school in Boston, I was in Cambridge, mm -hmm. but people will usually not say they went to Harvard. Damn. There's a bit of like a pompous, like, like, essence that comes with saying it's like I went to Harvard. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Like, I think like, that's, that that's what you're talking about. Part right? of it, yeah. yeah. Got you, got you. There's a lot of tech humor. People, um, they make these skits of like people who went to like uh, HBA, Harvard, and then like, yeah, you know, like we did a class together, like uh, HBA, you know, a couple of years back. You know, like no big deal. Like they just like dash it in there and like they cover it up and then keep it talking. Yeah. Just to like, hey, like this is where I'm at. Just so talk to me nice, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So after Harvard, what was the next step for you? So I came back to Toronto and I worked at Maple Leaf Foods actually okay. in their global, they had an international business and I was in a global business development role. 
And the reason for that is that I studied the intersection between business and emerging markets, and I was really excited about working for a company that was investing in emerging markets and had business in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. So I had done some work. I, one of the cool things I was able to do is uh, I did an internship between my first and second years uh, at the UN. So I worked for the United Nations Development Program. But I was much more excited about being a business that was making decisions as opposed to organizing a conference or writing a paper mm -hmm. about companies that were doing cool things. Yeah. So. I think I realized I was much more excited about being an operator than, you know, someone who is on the either academic or, or not-for-profit side. That's mm. a fact. And you got into not-for-profit side, right? What's that like switching from working in like in a regular work environment, corporate nine to five, to getting into the, you know, not-for-profit side? Yeah. In some ways, I think a lot of people might be surprised that there's not that many differences between for-profit and not-for-profit. If you're an accountant, you're still doing accounting. Still doing accounting. Uh, you know, whatever it is that you're you're doing, sometimes the day to day isn't that different. But I do think one of the nice things is that you're working with people who are really motivated by the mission, mm -hmm. and in that way, I think being in a not for profit is very similar to being at a startup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's one thing that I think is very key because a lot of people just say, "Hey, I'm going in, home, I'm going in, clocking in, and I'm clocking out, and I'm getting my ass home." Right. You know what I'm saying? Whereas a not for profit is like a real mission behind it. They're trying to do whether it be like help, helping kids out, helping a specific mission out. Yeah. And that really helps you drive it because like sometimes when you're at work and you have that little microaggression that gets to you, it's like, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. know, you're ready to go. Like, well, <laughs> why it, am I it, really? It makes sense to have a purpose that you wake up to. Like, you know what? I'm doing this because of this. And that's what I find with a lot of people who work in not for profit space. And yeah. Um, yeah. So giving us a timeline from like your graduation to working to entrepreneurship um, in those times when you're doing not for profit and you're doing consulting did you ever consider being an entrepreneur like did you ever look at that idea as something to pursue I did but I would say it was always off to the side like how people talk about wanting to quit their job and travel the world for a yeah. year do you know what I mean I, I think I did an undergrad in, in business and so I was around a lot of people who are interested in business and we talked about it. It's like, okay, well, one day when we start a company together, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, but it didn't really go much farther than that. So I think I'm a bit surprised to find myself here. I wouldn't necessarily have put myself as a natural entrepreneur to yeah. reference, uh, you know, the conversation we had earlier. Mm -hmm. I don't think I was really that person, you know, the kid who had a lemonade stand or anything like that. Uh, I don't know. I grew up really like not around that many entrepreneurs and not around that many people who'd started businesses. So for me, it was really important that I went to a school that I could get a job mm -hmm. afterwards and pay off my student loans. Mm -hmm. To me, being an entrepreneur felt like, you know, something other people did, not not people like me. So you never even like had like a moment where you're jotting like notes or doing sketches of an idea on a napkin. You know how they always have like people yeah. have like this napkin folders of like ideas yeah. they had. You never had one of those? I I guess I did. Do you yeah. know what? So if I if I go back, uh, there were different points in my life where I thought about different businesses that I wanted to mm -hmm. start. So yeah, I guess it was always it would was you, always there. Would you want to start? Yeah, I wanted to start a food business. Actually, really? I was like, really interested in food and how to make cooking food more accessible. It was actually pretty similar to a lot of these meal kit ideas now that it become very prevalent. Mm -hmm. But this was you know back maybe fifteen years ago that. I thought would be cool. You know what? I have an idea for a business that I think this needs to happen. An egg subscription business. I also have a subscription idea. So <laughs> okay. you yeah, know what so I'm going to talk Don't, don't, don't me. tell us. Right, right. <laughs> how many times do you, how many times do you eggs in a week? I eat eggs two times a day. Two times a day. No, no, no. Like I eat two eggs a day. Uh, <laughs> I was about to say eggs twice a day. You're going crazy. All right. I need that protein, man. I need that <laughs> yeah, protein. Facts. Yeah, same. Two eggs a day. How about yeah. you? Uh, I'm a big egg consumer too, and I do find I run out of eggs a lot. Right? Yeah. Yes. How much you? How much eggs you eat? Maybe one every two days. One every two days. Yeah. Neon. Zero, zero eggs. eggs. Mm. All right, one person. Look at that. One out of five people eat zero eggs. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, listen, an egg subscription service. I'd subscribe to that. Twenty bucks a month. <laughs> How you mean? How many crates are you getting? Oh, I'm going crazy. The 36? So 36 a week. like 36 a week. 36 Easy. a week. I'm going crazy on that. Delivered. Delivered straight to your door. Oh, man, I'll pay for that. 
I pay for that. I'm worried about the waste, the breakage in this model. Literal breakage. The packaging has to be the elite. Package has to yeah. be elite. Has to be proper. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> probably like 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 thick plastic. I'm thinking. Yeah. You know, see, the the challenge here is the weight. That's what they have learned in mm -hmm. e-commerce. Weight is everything. Mm -hmm. Because in order to ship properly, the weight is everything. People will have glass bottles and have to switch to plastic gotcha. just because of the weight. So that's the only thing that I think would be tough is the breakage of the eggs yeah. and getting them to. But you look, might. if the eggs can go to a grocery store, they can get to a house. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm feeling this idea. I'm definitely a customer. All right, what you got? My, my, my idea is similar to Alex's. We're looking at foods that people eat every day. And that's an avocado subscription business. I mean, think about everybody who likes guac. I like guac. Mm -hmm. I just had a Super Bowl party like two weeks ago. Yeah. Had massive bowl of uh, guac. I would pay for getting avocados like every single week to my door. You eat them with eggs, you eat them with yeah. everything. And they're like at a, such a premium price in the grocery store. So if you give it someone at a lesser cost yeah. and they're fresh at the door, yeah, that's a good business. What do you think about that? I, I want to know if there's a ripeness guarantee. Because I feel Ooh. like with avocados, they're like not ripe, not ripe, not ripe. And then it's like, uh, you have to throw them out. Yo, so do you hear about this? There's a TikTok <laughs> trend. I'm so excited. About that. I know, Drew. I'm so excited. Yo, so apparently if you put um, avocados in water and let them soak, they don't go bad. Okay. You know what I'm saying? But how so, long okay. do you leave them on the, on the, on the water fridge? So you put them in the water and you put them in the fridge. Mm. And, they, and, they go, and they stay fresh for like, a, like 10 times Does a time. Does temperature matter? No, it was a fridge. Oh, I mean, like in the water. Like, is it hot water, or like cold water, or just right, room, temperature right, water. room temperature? Yeah, yeah. Put it in, put it in there. Hack. And then and just let it let it sit and it will maintain okay. its freshness. My mom, who is a big TikTok person, said plastic bag once the avocado is ripe, put it in a plastic bag and then put it in the fridge. Mm. So maybe really? we should do a little bit of testing. Like a little test. A little yeah, A B yeah. test. Yeah, yeah. A B <laughs> testing. Water good testing. That in plastic bag. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I'm up for it. All right. Word, word. So, so let's jump ahead a bit, you know. So we talked about you in the uh, not-for-profit space. Now, let's talk more about, you know, you getting into Borrow Well. Because mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, from doing a little bit of back research, you were pregnant at the time when you just got started? I, I was on maternity leave. You were on maternity so, yeah, leave. Yeah, I had a four-year-old and a one-year-old. You had a four-year-old and a one-year-old, and you were on maternity leave. So you're about to have the kid. Right? I, I had the kid. You had the kid, had sorry. The kid. Is that how it goes? Yeah. I didn't know that. I <laughs> you, was... you, have, you have the kid and, then, so and, then, you, and then you cut I from maternity leave. Was... Got you, got you. How, I thought... how long is maternity leave, by the way? Is that like six months? Or... Six months? Uh, so you can take <coughs> as little or as long a time as you want. I think in Canada, you can take up to 18 months now. I took about a year. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's cool. cool. But it, it's not, I mean, it maybe sounds like a break. It is so much hard it's a, work. It, it's like another it? job. Yeah, yeah. But it's a loving job, though. One well, that you don't get paid for, where your your colleagues, quote unquote, you know, could throw up on you and expect you to clean their Clean it up. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that yeah. kid needs a job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Eating for free, it's, it's doesn't job. pay rent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So walk us through that time of your life where you were on maternity leave and somehow ended up at Borrowell. Yeah. I'm happy to chat about that. So my co-founder, Andrew, had quit his job about six months before I joined and was exploring different ideas in fintech. And his background, he had been running the insurance business at PC Financial mm -hmm. and saw that the credit card business just made a killing every single quarter. Mm -hmm. And so he was really curious about how do credit cards work and you know why do they make so much money? Mm -hmm and realize that credit card debt is a huge problem. Consumer debt in general is a huge problem in Canada. And I think at the time it was, you know, $60 billion of credit card debt that uh, the Canadians held. 60 billion? Yeah, 60 it's crazy. It is it's a disgusting. crazy number. Wow. So he was looking around the world to see, you know, what's happening in fintech in other places that, you know, and are there ideas that uh, could be applied in Canada. And one of them was, you know, that at the time, a lot of people were doing personal loans online mm. to help people refinance. And for debt. context, what year, what year is so this? So this is 2014. 2014, gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah. And then he was telling me about the idea. I thought it was like super cool. I was sort of looking for my next thing. And I made a bit of a flippant comment to say, well, if I can't find another job, I'll just come and join your startup. Mm -hmm. And he, I expected him to laugh it off. And he didn't. He got pretty serious, looked me in the eye and said, well, what would you want to do? And again, I'm sort of being like, I don't know. Like, what do you need done? I'm happy to do whatever. And he said, well, do you know what? I need to practice my pitch. 
why don't they come, give you the pitch, and you can decide what you want to do from there. Gotcha. So he pitched me on Borowell, and I was really taken because it was both solving a big social problem, which I cared about, mm -hmm. as well as it sounded like the opportunity to build a really big business as well. Yeah. And I think those two things made it seem super exciting. And after the pitch, I was like, why don't I just come and work for you for free for a couple of weeks? I was like really excited to get out of the house because I'd been home with two young two kids, kids for yeah. uh, for like 10, 11 months. And at that early stage in a company, you take as much free labor as you can get. Yeah. So that's where it started out is with two weeks that turned into three months and mm. turned into seven and a half years. Mm. Is that a hack? Yeah, we should use like look out, look out for women on maternity leave. Honestly, <laughs> you should look out for women on maternity leave because I think they're super eager to, to work. I had such a low bar when I got there. It was like, A, no one follow, follows me to the bathroom. Yeah. B, I don't have to feed anyone lunch. I can just eat, eat. my own food. Exactly. And I could have adult conversations and no one's going to throw up on me. So, yeah. you know, the bar is pretty low, I think, for anyone, any parent who's been on parental leave. And what was like the MVP that he showed you? Like, were you just sold on the idea of what the what the whole concept was, or did he show you like, hey, this is like a working prototype that we have? I don't think there was an MVP. Even the pitch didn't have uh, like the the product necessarily in like a prototype form. But I think it was just the fact that it was such a big problem, mm -hmm. and felt like there needed to be better solutions than what existed. Mm -hmm. So, how did he convince you to stay? Actually, no, 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 because because when you you start getting like enwrapped into the into the company, right, and you're mm -hmm. on maternity leave, were you at the point of looking for a new job at this point, or were you just like, hey, I'm still feeling it out, like, and how did you break that to the family as well? Because on maternity leave, you're still like trying to take care of the kid and stuff like that. How do you break that to your husband and, you know, like walk us through that time? That's, yeah, that could be a no, he's, that. no, he was super supportive. I okay. was planning on going back to my job that I had had before. Mm -hmm. okay. So it really was just, hey, I'm going to defer that. It wasn't something that I was super, super excited about mm -hmm. doing because I'd been there already for five years. So I was sort of looking for the next thing. Got you. And a lot of people say, oh, it's like so risky that you sort of took this leap. I think there are a couple of things. One is that I was on maternity leave, so I, it's not like I was making a huge amount of income that I was walking away from. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't have to walk in and sort of quit my job. I just said, hey, I'm not coming back. Mm -hmm. And uh, my employer at the time was super kind and said, hey, if you do want to come back, like let us know if that's this nice. thing doesn't work out. Yeah, that's really nice. And then I also felt very much like if I if this didn't work out, I would just get a job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't feel like if I'd failed at a startup, it would somehow make me unemployable. Yeah. If anything, it makes you more employable because you've learned a whole bunch. Exactly. So, and maybe it was that I felt like I could fall back on my degree, mm -hmm. but it's like, I think I could just get a job. Like it's uh once you have like the experience you have, the education you have, there's really nothing to worry about at that point. Yeah. You already had the support of your husband. Yeah. Um, your you knew Andrew. Like, it, yeah, just everything right. was just connected, and you know there's no point of looking back even if it failed because you can just maybe go do another startup and yeah. try another idea. It must have like not have been just bore. It's either bore well or die trying, right? Yeah. You have options. Yeah, I think that's right. And I would, I would argue that most people have options, mm -hmm. right? It's, uh, and I think the learning is so great that if you can sort of afford to go without the salary that you would normally have. And I think, you know, obviously we were fortunate and I was a bit later in my career, we'd paid off, um, you know, my student loans and things like that. But we also made pretty intentional choices to, you know, not live a lavish lifestyle. We didn't have huge expenses. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, my husband you know, didn't make a ton of money. He was working for a not-for-profit at the time. But we just, you know, kept things pretty simple. Mm. Gosh, yeah. So now let's get into my favorite part, the marketing, the, the growth phase. The growth phase. You know what I'm saying? I don't yeah. know if you know, but I have a marketing agency. That's my thing, you know? Yeah. So... Let's let's talk about it. You know, during that time period, you know, it's like five of you in the room, you know, yep. trying to figure it out. How are you acquiring customers? Yep. That's the most like one of the most challenging things right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So yep. Walk us through that. Yeah. So I can tell you all the mistakes that we made, <laughs> which included spending too much money on Google AdWords without, I think, testing enough into it. So at the beginning, it was really pretty focused on digital. Uh, digital channels, so Google mm -hmm. and Facebook. 
And again, the first product that we had was the personal loan. Mm -hmm. And what we found was we actually had a ton of people come to us. Mm -hmm. The problem was that very few of them were qualifying for the loan that we had out there. Mm -hmm. And back in 2014, I sort of like in, uh, you know, online loans in 2014 to what online dating must have been in like 1999, yeah. which is like, it's not mainstream. So the only people who are there are really weird and desperate. And I think with online loans, it was really like a lot of people just looking for payday loans, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, we were offering a prime loan that had low interest rates and people who could qualify for a loan at a bank weren't looking online for loans. And so that I think was challenging for us. Um, and eventually this is what led us to launching free credit scores, mm -hmm. uh, was a way actually to solve a marketing and a customer acquisition problem. We wanted to find people who had good credit scores. And so we're like, okay, well, what could we do? We looked again, what do other uh, companies like ours do around the world? Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, leads for personal loan products came from these marketplaces that offered credit education. Yeah. So your your product is, uh, even before asking the question, just for like our listeners understanding mm -hmm. what Borrowell Borrow Borrow is today, what is that like, that elevator pitch so they understand what we're talking yeah. about before even going deeper into marketing and all the nitty gritties yeah. and stuff like that? That's a great question. So Borrowell's mission is to make financial prosperity possible for everyone. Mm -hmm. And we do that a few different ways. We were the first company to offer credit scores for free in Canada. Mm -hmm. And we offer lots of tips and advice to help people improve their score. Yep. We also offer product recommendations to help people pick the best financial products for where they are. And as we help people improve their score, we've got a credit building loan product and secured credit card products that, um, that can help people accelerate the process of building their credit profile. But what really people want eventually is to do things like be able to pay off some debt and, mm -hmm. you know, it's easier to do that if you're paying lower interest rates. So mm -hmm. as your credit score improves, we can offer you loans that have lower interest rates. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people have a goal of wanting to buy a home at one point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like helping people to qualify for a mortgage. Gotcha. So, um, yeah. So we offer today a really personalized marketplace that helps people understand the products that they're going to be approved for mm -hmm. and also make it super easy for people to get those products. So we do lots of, um, you know, super, you know, great integrations that make it very easy for you to understand your likelihood of approval for a product and then in a couple of clicks actually find out if you're This podcast is brought to you by Narai Sellers Wine, one of the only black owned wine companies in Canada. So not only are you supporting the show, but you're supporting black ownership. Now, who is Narai Sellers Wine? They have 10 years of experience in winemaking and let me tell you i've given this to our camera guy i've given this to my girls and trust me they keep it a buck and they've all attested to the quality of this wine so what we're gonna do is gonna hit the link below and visit naraisellers.ca and try the wine for yourself let's get back into the show actually i got a story for you i i got one of my credit cards my American Express simply cash from Borowell actually. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you know, so I got to give you I got to give you credit. I got to pay homage for that. Yeah, I was just on it. I was just looking I was like, "Hey, uh get this thing uh simply cash." I, I already had an American Express Cobalt card, okay. but I didn't know about the simply cash. So I right. just went through uh Borowell and I got my card through that. So I was just like, "This is this is nice. This is Great. nice." That's so, awesome. you know, you said one thing about is the credit scores and uh you partner with Equifax yep. as a as a partner for your to get the scores. What I want to understand is, isn't there like a conflict of interest uh, because we go to Equifax to get our credit scores uh, and understand it? But yep. here you are, I can easy sign up to Borwell, attach my SIN number, and boom, I, I've got my 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 credit score. How does that work? Like, how does how do you help them and uh, how do they help you yep. knowing that this is what they're trying to sell us? Yeah. So it's a great question. And in many ways, Equifax had to make the decision to cannibalize a little bit of their sales in order to work with us. Mm -hmm. I guess one thing to recognize for Equifax is that what they sell to consumers is a relatively small part of their business. Gotcha. Most of their business is uh, selling data to financial institutions, banks, like not just data, but you know, selling different data services. 
And so uh, what they sell to consumers is relatively small. Mm-hmm. I think the other thing is that the percentage of the population that will pay to get their credit score and credit report is relatively small compared to the number of people who will do it if they get it for free. Mm-hmm. And so uh, even though we would pay less than what you would have to pay, because we have so many people getting that credit data, mm-hmm. uh, it makes sense for Equifax. So we've become quite a large customer for them. Mm-hmm. And I think it was you know, smart of them to recognize that even though in the short term it might be painful, it might mean that some people, uh, there might be fewer people who sort of pay for the service. Um, in the in the long run, it's like worked out pretty well for them because mm-hmm. we've become a really big customer. Yeah. One yeah. step back to go 10 steps forward. That's how you play the game. Yeah. You know? So you're getting customers in now. Um, one thing that stands out to me as it must be a pivotal moment for you is being a group of five, four or five, six people and approaching a bank yeah. to do business. Yeah. Walk us through that because I can only imagine you feeling like you're going against a Kraken to get this business done. Yeah. Like, walk yeah. us through the Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that's right because you're referencing we had a partnership with a bank and even to work with Equifax, which is a big company, Very big company we, yeah. were, we were pretty small. And mm-hmm. yeah, I think we're literally like five, six people. I think the one thing for everyone to remember is that you really just have to convince one person. Mm-hmm. You mean as big and as scary as the bank or as a credit bureau is, you do just have to convince one person. It has to be the right person. Yeah. But someone who's willing to go to bat and, and says, you know, I'm going to make this happen. Mm-hmm. And if the right person says, I'm going to make this happen, then that really paves the way. Not to say that it isn't a long process or that there aren't lots of hoops to jump through. But I think for us in each of those situations, there was one person on the other side who really believed in us for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And and that was super helpful. What bank was this? Uh, it was with CIBC. With CIBC. Yeah. And now like acquiring other other banks has become like way easier now over time, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's been funny because uh, some banks or financial institutions, it takes you know months and months and years in some mm-hmm. cases to bring them on board. But now we have, uh, yeah, every major bank on our platform. So, so we'll break that down. Like when I feel like that pitch must have been like a monumental moment for the company. You know, were you there? Were you there in that pitch? Like, walk, what were some of the pivotal moments that you saw? Who was pitching? Did you well, like, yeah, who was like, slick? Was it like a Don Draper pitching? Like, yeah, like I feel like you're going into <laughs> war at that moment. Yeah. Like, it's super interesting because I guess there's a couple of things. We did a, a partnership with CIBC, but then in terms of getting people onto our platform, I uh, It really is just being relentless. I mean, I'm sure this isn't news to any to any of you or any of your listeners. But for us within the bank, I feel like 80 percent of the challenge was finding the right person that if you went to senior, it wasn't a problem that they were dealing with. If you go to junior, they don't care or, you know, you don't find the right person. But when we found the person who was responsible for credit card acquisition and what they needed to do was like get more credit card customers and we had this new solution for them. I remember one person saying, you know, they were relying on like a reader's digest list and like calling people. So, you know, it's like they're getting really, really niche. I know, and archaic. So when we said, hey, we've got this platform of however many, you know, tens of thousands of people at the time, today we're over 2 million. uh, And we're saying, hey, we've got people who are looking for financial products. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can email them, we can put you on the platform, you know, and, uh, and we made it really easy for them too. It's like, literally, if you give us a link and, uh, essentially all we need is a tracking link, we could, we would often say, we just need like the asset, like we need the, uh, uh, the, the picture of the credit card, but you know, you could find that and just like Mm -hmm. copy it. We're like, we just need a tracking link and then we'll put you up. It's like, not that hard. Yeah. Uh, we made the integration pretty easy for them too. Mm, So there's some big lessons there. So one find the right person yeah and make it as easy as it can be for them yeah. to sign on to the process yeah no i, I know that i know that grind about finding the right person because i work in sales yeah and you like you're using all the tools that you have like whether it's sales navigator having these conversations doing cold calls talking someone likes you what you got to say now you got to get them to connect you with this other person yeah it takes a long process but once you get that person it's yeah. it's money yeah. And, and they like yeah. you, but it takes a while, right? And you as a person who's reaching out, you got to be really patient with everything, that whole process that you really want to get to where you want to be. Yeah. And um, that leads to the next question. Like, how long was that process for the whole company? Like, was it like from opening the dialogue to closing? How long did it take to close the business? 
I mean, it really varied from partner to partner. And yeah. I'm not joking when I say that some of them, it was years. Years, eh? Yeah, years to get someone on the platform. What? Because you would have a conversation and they'd be excited, but then it needs to, you know, we, we might have to go through info security through the bank and get approved as a vendor. Mm -hmm. And so some of these processes took huge amounts of time. Mm -hmm. we, there might be a site visit. They would come, inspect what kind of shredder you use, like... It kind was of what? Shredder. Shredder. Like, shredder? Yeah, paper shredder. To make sure that the paper shredder we had, in case we printed any sensitive documents. Wow. Would shred. You know, um, it's like, yeah. Yeah. It was pretty, pretty interesting. Shredder. Some of these, Yo, like, documents. I, I mean, again, as a small company, it was, <coughs> we, um, they asked us our policy on like conflict minerals. It's mm -hmm. like, we, we don't purchase or sell blood diamonds. Like, I'm not sure. It's just what? like, it, you can understand how, you know, someone deep in their supply chain would say, hey, this is an issue. We need to make sure we don't work with anyone who, you know, does no. X. And then all of a sudden you're trying to become a supplier of the bank and you have to provide your, you know, mm -hmm. conflict mineral policy. <laughs> Yo, that's nuts. Yeah. Yo. Lots of funny stories like that. We could spend all night really? yeah, going yeah. over some of these things. That's crazy. All yeah. right. So that's so interesting. Now let's let's move on. You, you start developing the business, and you start um, you know acquiring banks to join credit card companies. Um, what was the product market fit when it comes to the acquisition that helped you scale? It was only the uh, the um, the credit card. Sorry, the the credit ratings. Is that is that the only thing that made you scale? And is that still what's helping you scale today, See, or is there I, other I, platforms that's helped? Yeah. Um, so. I think one of the things that we found out was that the product market fit felt like a lot easier with credit score monitoring than mm -hmm. it did when we started out with loans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how I long, think- How long, sorry to cut you off. Yeah. No how, how long was that process between doing the loans and then figuring out that the ratings was- Yeah, actual... it was about a year, actually. Okay. It's not yeah. that long. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, maybe. It was a long year. It felt, yeah, it it felt was like a long year. Long year. Like a long year. Yeah. <laughs> but you're right. Like it was uh, it, in the grand scheme of things, wasn't that long. And once we launched credit scores, I think we realized that oh, there's something here yeah. because we like today we offer a full credit score and credit report. Mm -hmm. It gets updated on a weekly basis. But at the very beginning, we only offered the score, not the report, and we only offered it like once every three months. Mm -hmm. So we started out with a real MVP. We knew that eventually we would want to do much more, but it's like, let's just see if there's anything in here. Mm -hmm. Are people interested in seeing what their credit score is? And who are these people? Like, why yeah. are they interested? What do they you know, want to know for? Uh, but in that first week, we had like, thousands of people sign up. So it was pretty exciting for us to be like, oh, like it just this sort of felt a, a little bit more like, oh, this is what product market fit feels like. Yes. You put something out that's very far from perfect, but there's lots of people who are interested mm -hmm. about it in it and telling their friends about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also too, like credit credit scores before Borowell, I um, remember my, my roommate at the time when I was at Ryerson, was like, I was like, man, I need to my credit score because I'm going to start like looking for a place and going to Equifax or TransUnion, it seems so daunting it seems mm. like oh uh, like it's like this big brother type of energy it's like dealing with the corporate but borwell was like so you know easy it's friendly it's like kind of there like with the ubers oh you just download this is how you do it yeah how did you get people to trust you like people like alex and i yeah to go put in our information and believe that this is the right data and information and the fact that i'm giving this information that it's going to be in good hands yeah no, we understood early on that trust was really, really important, that people mm -hmm. needed to trust who we were. So we were upfront about like all the bank level security that we had and, you know, took all that very seriously. I think we also wanted to project that, um, that sort of image of trust, even through the name. Like when we were picking names for Borowell, we'd ask people what, you know, we had a whole bunch of different names and we asked people like, what does this make you think of? Mm -hmm. And for Borowell, it was actually things like law firm or like old English town. And yes. so it felt like it maybe had a bit more gravitas than some names that, you know, had lots of vowels and, you know, misspelled words. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess Borowell is also two misspelled words. But uh, we were very, very careful in the language that we used. We tried to be, you know, really professional but friendly. I think there's a lot of things we could have done. I mean, this is up your world in terms of like what's the brand and what's the tone. We wanted to be, uh, you know, that friend that is 
good at their personal finances, but you could still have a beer with. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And actually, as we uh, we asked people if Borwell were a person, what would they be like? That's some of the things that we we mm, heard. Okay. Uh, we didn't want to sort of be too fast and loose. We were very careful to like proofread our website and make sure there were no spelling mistakes. I think there's mm. a bunch of things like that that we really tried to yeah. show people we were a real company backed by real people. Yeah, because like in startup world, it's just like, cra- what's that thing they always say? Build fast, crash, yeah, crash yeah, and burn. Yeah, move fast, well, break things. Move fast and break things. Move, move break things. Yeah. I'm like, I, I think you need to like sometimes take a pause for the cause and actually just analyze. Yeah. Are we really moving in the right direction yeah. before pressing the That's green right. button? We actually did print out something that said like, move fast and please try not to break anything. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that. What were some of the losers in the, in the name category? Um, you remember any? Calabra, I think, was one. Oh, God. Uh, well, what was really funny is we paid a company, like, not that much money. I think it was slightly more than Fiverr. Uh, maybe it was, like, $150. And some of the names they came back with, one of them was Grand Scheme Financial. Oh, my I don't know if uh, they understood what a scheme was. And maybe they were too much into money car racing video or games like or that. something like that. <laughs> so that was definitely not one that we were going to use yeah definitely yeah okay so let's get into credit for a second you know because um that's the the name of the game that we're talking about today what are some common mistakes that you see people do with their credit you know that stands out to you yeah i i think one common mistake is that people are scared that their credit will be bad so they don't want to check it Mm -hmm. and what i you know it's one of those things where austria put your head in the sand if i don't know then you know it will hurt me yeah which is not true actually (laughs) if it's bad it will still hurt you so one of the things i like to share is that the majority of people have good credit and if you don't have good credit there are actually things you can do to improve your credit Mm -hmm. so i think it's much better to find out and then you know you can work to improve things before you're applying for a mortgage because that's not when you want to find out that your credit score is maybe not as good as it should be yeah it's gonna be too little too late at that point yeah i remember actually when i joined borwell i had no credit at all Mm. and i was trying to get a phone from virgin and they're like hey do you have like a credit card and i was like no i don't so i think they did like a soft check on me and actually having no having um no credit it's like having like bad credit at the same time because like you had no trust so i had to get like a security um capital one security secured card secured card from borrowell it was like 300 bucks spent a whole year building Mm. my credit you know i had i had my netflix spotify in there paid it off credit card uh, credit credit score shot up to like 770 or 750 then over time i've just been very like passionate about <laughs> you know it's like a, it's like a, it's like a fun thing for me yeah. to build out my credit and yeah. uh it's fun when That's you log awesome. on to borrow well and you see oh like I, i'm about to close i'm touching 800 now right yeah what can i do to like get this higher and higher so my i my goal is to like get to like 810 820 and uh hopefully get to like maybe is it 900 so 900 is a theoretical max, the- but with uh, the Equifax where we give out, I, there actually aren't any people who have a 900. So. What, what's the really? highest? You it's see? a good question. I think because our database obviously has, you know, is pretty representative. I don't know 100. percent My guess is it's like an 862 or something like that. That 862, right? Eh? The actual highest, which is yeah. I I don't. I mean, honestly, like where you're at today. You'll be able to qualify for anything you want. Anything. To. Yeah. It just becomes a fun game for some people to try to get yeah. as high a score as possible. Actually, I'd say that's another misconception. I think a lot of people who are you know afraid about getting into credit card debt think that using a credit card is bad, mm-hmm. but it's not if you use it responsibly and it actually can be a good way to, you know, get points or get cash back and to build a credit score, because again, that day that you want to go get a mortgage that lender wants to know that you've been able to manage credit and make payments mm-hmm. and uh, and manage that responsibly. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to the One thing that's always stuck with me is the util- utilization rate. Utilization rate, oh, yeah. You guys are experts. Hell no. We know our stuff. <laughs> Hell no, no, <laughs> we are not. Experts. Um, that's the only thing that's really helped is that util- utilization rate. You yeah. know what I'm saying? That 20%, 30%. Yeah. What has helped you in, in your credit card you know, journey? Yeah, that's one thing for sure. I would say one thing that has not helped is that because of my role, I end up applying for a lot of products just to like try things oh, yeah, out. You get all the yeah. marketing, so you're like, oh, you know what? That, that's actually pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Maybe I mean, a little that. bit of that. Also, it's like, oh, I should just try this out to understand like what the product is like. Yes. So I probably have 
apply for more products than a normal person would. I'm the same thing, you know. Yeah. For me, it was with, with podcasts. I'm like, yo, listen, I got to listen to podcasts. So I'm listening to everything on Under the Sun. Mm-hmm. I'm listening to everything from Joe Rogan to Fresh and Fit. And I'm like, listen, I can't be watching yo, this stuff. Yo, you're a student of the game, man. Student of the game. <laughs> student of the That's game, what you're doing. Bro. You're supposed to be you know? student of the game. Yeah. Yeah. You know right. um, oh, you're about to... I was gonna change topics, so go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna change topics as well. I actually want to know, like, what are some of the things you do outside of work? Like, yes. What are some of your passions and hobbies? Yeah, so I mentioned before that I really like food. Mm-hmm. I still like to cook a lot and bake. And then uh, if you check in my Instagram, Eva, I think it's Eva underscore Toronto, or maybe just Eva Toronto, I post a lot of baking shots. Mm-hmm. Well, That's fun. What, what's your, uh, like, your craving? Like, what is something, if I make you, like, oh my gosh, you made this? Um, I am a big fan of bread, so okay. bread, bread. Is, is good. And the only thing better than bread is fried bread. So I would say it's like bread. donuts or anything oh, okay. that got you. Got you. is in that. You know, who would be a great person to ask is your children, like what they're, this will let, this will let us know what your, 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 your top baking or yes. something to make is because yeah. kids always like keep it real with you. They'll be like, yeah, that's true. I, I love this. Oh, like you tell them I'm baking this. You see how they react. It's like, oh my God, mommy's yeah. making this, whatever, yeah. whatever. So they're big fans of chocolate chip cookies. Yes. Because we make like a like a giant chocolate chip cookie that's five inches across. So that is a, a favorite. And then donuts actually are a favorite as well. You guys make donuts we, at home. Yeah, we will make donuts at home mm-hmm. filled with pastry cream or like Nutella and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. those are pretty popular. So. so. Yeah, you guys coming over for uh, for breakfast this weekend? Let's do it. How more yeah. for a cookie cookie fest? Yeah, I, like I got that. a bomb snack that I make. You know yeah, what I'm eh? I got uh, this is this is my thing right here because we just got an air fryer, you know, and I've been going like ham on the yeah, air fryer. Abuse, yeah. abuse, abuse, no excuse. You man. have an air fryer? Yeah, I do. Oh, I, I I have a lot of appliances. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had a feeling that like you have a lot of appliances. Your yeah. kitchen is probably decked out with so yeah. many like cool appliances to use. Too many. Too what's many. what's the appliance that you know is like over unnecessary but you love it? That's a good question. I was really nervous about buying a waffle iron because I didn't. That feels like the kind of thing nah, that never damn, gets yeah, used. <laughs> but we used the waffle iron a good amount, yeah. so uh, I don't regret that. I, I took I took um I took my girl to Niagara Falls for our anniversary, and um, we took a waffle. <laughs> 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 okay, that is next level. When you travel <laughs> with your waffle iron, yeah, uh, <laughs> we, we, we travel with the waffle iron yeah. just, just, to, just to make sure that she could have a. That's waffle a commi- on her commitment. You are committed. Yeah. You are. I had to make sure she got give the, her girl for an fun. experience. And the thing is, too, is that in some hotels, you don't get a microwave, right? Yeah. Right. So we were warming up <laughs> food on the, on the waffle uh, waffle maker. No, nah, man. You respects to that, bro. Respects, bro. You feel me? You feel me? Yeah. All right. So working towards wrapping up, you know what I'm saying? Oh, actually, no. You don't ask a question. Yeah. Right? You know, I'm, I want to ask you, you know, like you're big on leadership a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Things that you talk about is, you know, becoming a leader, especially you as like a woman leader in mm-hmm. tech, um, you know, what are some things that about leadership that we always hear that you'd like to debunk from your experience being a leader at Borowell so far? Yeah, I think one of the things, one of the sort of stereotypes out there is that you have to create like a ton of stress and be as like crazy maniac in order to get good results from people. Mm-hmm. I think Steve Jobs is like one of those examples, like Elon Musk a little bit, you know, you have to mm-hmm. be that like crazy super visionary person and stress people out in order for them to do their best work. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just not sure that's true. I yeah. think there's lots of, you know, brain research and science that would say that when people are stressed, that's actually not when they do their most creative work. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think being very clear and providing like clarity of vision is, uh, it is important for sure. And I think those like leaders do that as well. And I love the fact that they're super aspirational and, and you know, have bro- break the mold. Mm-hmm. I just don't know that, you know, everyone needs to create that kind of more hostile work environment in order for course, people to, to thrive. Your whole career, you were in consulting, not for profit. Then Andrew comes and asks you, hey, join my team, puts the COO label on you. Did you ever feel imposter syndrome of never being in a leadership position from as far as we know right now to being like a leader of like a grow, fast growing tech company? For sure. I think imposter syndrome affects a lot of people and uh, I'm not immune uh, from it either. I do think it was helpful that when I was COO, I, it was still like a five person company. So, you know, it was a little bit of an inflated title. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think 
you know, a, a lot of people feel like, oh, I don't have the right experience to be here. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was helpful for me is even looking at someone like uh, a Mark Zuckerberg, it's like, why do people feel like uh, a 20 year old college dropout could found a tech company? And that feels very normal to all of us. Mm -hmm. But a 35 year old woman who's got 10 plus years of career experience couldn't do this. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It just like didn't, doesn't seem to make logical sense. Yeah. So I do think that it's, it's not about, you know, discounting your own ability or like discounting someone else's ability. It's more just like, look, we all have a fair shake at this. Everyone brings something different to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do think it's important for people to see it in order to be it. Like I've been very encouraged to see other people, other women, other people of color lead mm -hmm. and lead in their own way and, and be really authentic about their own leadership style. And that's always been really encouraging to me. Like, oh, I could be that kind of leader. I don't have to be the Steve Jobs kind of leader. Yeah. Yeah. I want to dive deeper into being like a woman in tech. Because one thing like, you know, researching you has been like a big proponent of something that you've established for your own brand, you know. Um, what has been your experience as a woman in tech? And um, where do you see opportunities for women in tech to grow? Yeah, I would say overall it's been very positive for me being a woman in tech. And I really want to encourage other women and people from underrepresented groups to, to think about it. I think the community in Toronto is so supportive. Mm -hmm. And there's also benefits that I think people don't recognize from maybe looking a bit different from everybody else. Mm -hmm. People remember you more often, right? I think a lot of times I've had more opportunities because people want a different perspective on a panel or want to hear from someone who, you know, again, maybe has a different background. Mm -hmm on the speaker circuit. So I would say I've gotten more than my fair share of opportunities because I have a different background. Mm -hmm. When did you start realizing that was a strength than a weakness? It's a good question because I think on the flip side, you can, you know, I, it was always, oh, they're just asking me because they need a woman on this panel or they're yeah. just asking me because they need to hit some sort of diversity quota. So I think it's always a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, enough people have said, it's not just because of that, you know, it's, there's other, other reasons as well. And I mean, in some cases it doesn't matter, right? Like take the opportunities that are given to you. Not everyone deserves all the opportunities they're given and mm -hmm. you just make the most of, 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 of what you're given. I think that's sort of our, what our responsibility is. Absolutely. Most definitely. So looking towards the future, you know, um, I, of course, I don't know if you can say where the company is going in the future, but um, what are some of the ways you're looking to acquire new customers in the future? You know, with TikTok being huge now, and you, like you said, you acquire most of your clients through Facebook, and Facebook's going through a huge change right now. Yeah. You know, so what are you seeing? Because you were leading the marketing, right? But uh, I was at one point. I don't anymore. I haven't for a few years. Okay. And Facebook was in the early days. Um, today we have, you know, a much more diverse mix. But we are on TikTok. So check out Borowell on, on TikTok if you want to see what, what's happening some there. Good, some good financial content. Yeah, there's some good financial content. Um, I think for us, like what the next step is for us is really becoming that mass market brand. And mm -hmm. I think we've tried to be very efficient in the use of our marketing dollars and doing anything that is more brand oriented, like, you know, giant billboards or uh, even TV commercials feels like it's harder to track. And, uh, but again, I think if we want to build that brand, it's really important for us. So that will probably be the next step for us is like, how do we go bigger and take some more risks and take some more bets around some of that? Interesting. Yeah. So like a Super Bowl commercial that you're talking about? Super Bowl commercial would be awesome. Super Bowl commercial would be awesome. Maybe okay. you know, Canadian Super Bowl commercial. What? what CFL, like, CFL championship. Yeah. <laughs> Stop playing. Man. Keep it a buck. We ain't watching Super Bowl. I mean, the Canadian ball like that, like that. What is a Canadian Super Bowl? It, in, in, in relativity, like what would be? Man, any Leafs game, like any Leafs playoff game is like the Super Bowl. Take it in. Like, the Leafs, like, they suck, but we treat them as if they are, like, the Patriots or the Cowboys. Like, come on. Uh, they're, they're the Cowboys of hockey. Nah, you know what it was? I think the closest thing we had to the Super Bowl was the Raptors finals. I was going to say that. NBA yeah. championships, right? NBA when championship. the Raptors make the finals. But, the whole country's watching. But you don't know if they're going to do that every single year, though. It's true. That's yeah. true. That's but true. you don't know who's going to make the Super, the Super Bowl. Well, at least you know there's a Super Bowl there that exists. There is a exists. Super Bowl. That's right. true. Yeah. 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 I'm talking about Canadian. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Got you. So, so I guess like Raptors when they win is is our Super Bowl, and then hockey maybe Blue Jays. Yeah. We our Super Bowl is whatever it makes it far enough. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we're without, making it far without the, the deepest playoff run. You know exactly. what I'm saying? Exactly. That's the Super Bowl. All right, all right. So work towards wrapping up. Um, where can people find you? Yeah. Like on social, you mean? Yeah, on social. social. Where can people find Borrowell? Yeah, you know? I mean Borrowell for sure. You can find us on the App Store or Play Store. At download the Borwell app. You can go to our website as well. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I'm on Instagram and Twitter, Eva underscore Toronto on Twitter. And I can't remember my Instagram handle, something like that on Instagram. We'll but. look it. We'll look it for you. Okay. Don't worry. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. So that wraps up the podcast. The hustle is what you can control. So control your grind and control your life. I'm Alex. And I'm Owen. And I'm Eva. And that's the show, y'all. Bang, bang, guys. Peace. Have a great week. HustleEverything.co for the merch. I was going to ask you about the merch. The merch is awesome. Thank like you very